Hello and welcome to the next in my series of lessons on the architecture of the CPU for the OCR J277 syllabus. Today we are going to be looking at von Neumann architecture. So just before we start, just a kind of pronunciation note, uh, a lot of other videos you'll see online will refer to this as the von Neumann architecture. That's using a kind of uh, American version of the pronunciation of his name. Uh, we'll discover later that von Neumann was Hungarian, so I'm going to try and stay closer to the original pronunciation of his name today. Nerd! So where are we on our syllabus here? Well, we're kind of getting towards the end here at the bottom, and we're looking at this area here, the von Neumann architecture, which will include a lot of information about the different registers that we need to know about for this course. So let's kind of flash back to the early days of computing. We've got two of the great early computers here. We've got the Colossus, which was built in 1943 at Bletchley Park in the UK to help break codes in World War II. Uh, a lot of people think this was created by Alan Turing. In fact, he created an earlier com computational device called the bomb that wasn't as advanced as this. The Colossus was created by a great computer engineer called Tommy Flowers. And then the Americans built the ENIAC in 1945. Uh, this was built for the US Army at the University of Pennsylvania. I believe it's the Moore School of Engineering. And this was used to calculate artillery firing tables uh, for wartime. So both very expensive early computer devices really revolutionized the field, but they weren't perfect. They had some problems. Just like early computers in general, they could not store programs in memory, just data. They were what we refer to as fixed program computers. If you wanted to change the program that they run, you basically had to rebuild the computer. You had to use switches and patch cables like you can see in this uh, pictures here to actually change it to run a new program. So the American ENIAC system if you wanted to change the program it was running, if you wanted to change the software, that took three weeks of engineering to run a different program. So clearly, these are really powerful computers. They were electronic, they were digital, but they were fixed programs, so they were limited in their use. Step forward this man, John von Neumann. Von Neumann was a gifted Hungarian-American mathematician who was involved with both the Manhattan Project, the plan to build the atomic bomb, and early computer science, amongst many other areas. He was one of the great uh, mathematical geniuses of his time. Towards the end of World War II, he kind of turned his vast intellect to computer science, and he came up with an important early computer architecture that helped solve some of the problems of earlier computers like the Colossus or the ENIAC. So a CPU architecture describes how the different components in a CPU are laid out and communicate with each other. In 1945, he described a computer architecture in which the data and the program are both stored in the computer's memory as binary data. This became known as the von Neumann architecture or the stored program computer. In some places is also referred to as the Princeton architecture because that's where he was based at the time. This meant that a computer built with this architecture would be much easier to reprogram. Previous computers, they just stored the data in their form of memory. It was kind of the program was hardwired almost. But if you, refer, if you actually take the program and store that as data in memory, then it's easy to swap in and out the program. You don't have to rebuild the computer each time. And it might seem like a very minor thing, but this was a huge advance in computer uh, engineering at the time. So here we have the classic diagram of the von Neumann architecture. So the first thing we need to look at is here we've got the memory and this holds both the data and the program as binary data in memory. This is the big idea of the von Neumann architecture. Now we also have a control unit and an ALU, what we put together to form the CPU on a modern computer system. We've got this idea that we're going to have registers that we'll look at in more detail in today's lesson. This is an example called the accumulator. It's kind of working memory for the ALU. We're going to have to have input and output. As we saw back in the very first lesson in this series, you need input and output for a computer system to work. 
And we've got these arrows which represent buses that transfer information around and between the different components in the computer. It's important note to note that a computer architecture is not an actual physical computer, it's just the idea of how a computer could be built. Von Neumann wasn't an engineer, he didn't build a von Neumann computer system. It was merely an idea that other people could use and incorporate in their designs to build better computer systems. We'll go through this again in case you've forgotten from the last lesson. The control unit is responsible for decoding the instructions and controlling how data moves around the computer system. The ALU is the arithmetic logic unit and it does the mathematical calculations, logical comparisons that are required by the computer. We've got buses, these are the wires that carry data around a computer. We've got input and output because users must be able to communicate with the computer and give it data, which is what we call input. And the computer needs a way of displaying results to the user, what we refer to as output. And we also have registers. So we've seen before these are temporary memory locations within the CPU that can be accessed very quickly. These are like the working memory of a CPU. There's two types of registers that you need to know about. Specialist registers are those that have specific control or data handling tasks to carry out, such as the memory address register, memory data register, accumulator, and program counter. And you also might have an array of general purpose registers, and these can be used by the programmer to hold intermediate results while working through calculations or algorithms. So let's take a closer look at those specialist registers. The first is the program counter, the PC. This stores the memory location or the address of the next instruction in a program to be executed. The program counter then passes this next address to the memory address register, the MAR. The memory address register stores the memory location or the address for data that needs to be fetched from memory or is going to be stored into memory. The memory data register, the MDR, stores data that has been fetched from or is waiting to be sent to memory. And finally, we have the accumulator. This stores the results of calculations made by the ALU and the value of inputs and outputs to and from the CPU. So understanding all these registers can be really difficult. It's very important for the OCR J277 exam that you understand which registers hold data and which hold memory locations slash addresses. So here we've got a very simplified version of a CPU. And in this CPU, we've got some registers. We've got the program counter, the memory address register, the MDR, and the accumulator. And over here, we've got our main memory, our RAM, and we've got a very simple program running. It's just gonna say, add five, store in memory, stop the program. And these are held at different memory locations. So these are in binary, so we've got memory location zero, one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So when we first start the computer and we run this program, the program counter is going to point to the memory address of the first line of the program. So in this case, it's pointing to the memory location zero. Okay, so the program counter is always going to hold memory location. So Where's the next line of program that's going to execute? Well, it's being held at memory location zero. Now this data then gets transferred to the memory address register. The memory address register is where we hold any memory location for data that we're going to fetch from memory or send to memory. So again, it's not holding any actual data, it's just going to hold a location in memory, a memory address. So in this case, it's saying we need to fetch some data from memory location zero, okay? So your computer will go to memory location zero, and we've got some data here. We've got the data add five. So when we move this to the CPU, it's going to be held in the memory address register. Sorry, I made a boo-boo straight away. I meant the memory data register, the MDR. See how easy it is to get those confused? I'm an expert, I still get it 
mixed up sometimes when I'm talking quickly. So the value add 5, that instruction, will be moved to the MDR, the memory data register, which as you see holds actual data, not a memory location, it holds data that has been fetched from RAM or any data that's going to be sent to RAM later on. So the instruction is add 5, so the control unit is going to decode that and start executing it. It's going to use the arithmetic logic unit because it's a mathematical operation and it's going to add 5 to the um, what already was stored in memory which would have been 0. So it's going to add 5 and once it's finished it doesn't want that answer just to disappear into the ether. That final value 5 is going to be stored in the accumulator. Okay, That's like temporary working memory for the ALU. So again the accumulator is going to hold data not a memory location. Now later on you might send that into RAM to store it somewhere in memory, but just now we're just going to hold it in the accumulator temporarily. Okay, So if you just take again a quick look at that, the program counter holds a memory location, the memory address register holds a location, but the MDR holds a data value and the accumulator holds a data value. You don't need to know what each register does and how they all work together in any detail for the syllabus. That's left more for the A-level students when they get onto that. You just need to really know one line description of what each register does and you have to be very clear, does it hold data or does it hold a memory address, a memory location? So as we saw before, it's easy to get the MAR and the MDR confused. I did it when I was speaking. It's easy to do when you're writing answers quickly in an exam. So the memory address register holds the location and memory of data or instructions. So whether you're going to fetch data instructions from memory or send something to memory, that address needs to be held in the MAR. It's where, not what. The memory data register, on the other hand, holds actual data. It holds data and instructions. So that could be data that's been fetched from memory, it could be data that's going to be sent to memory in a moment, but it holds actual data itself. Let's summarize that. The von Neumann architecture includes programs and instructions and data both loaded into memory, which makes it much more flexible. It needs a control unit, an arithmetic logic unit, buses and registers. It needs input and output for the user and the computer to communicate. And this is still the fundamental design behind all modern computer systems. We've made changes and alterations over the years, but your basic computer, your PC, your laptop, your smartphone, your tablet, essentially they're all following this von Neumann architecture model. That's how important it was, even though that was 70 years ago, we still follow that architecture today. I hope that was helpful to you. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Until the next lesson, I will wish you a good day. Good luck with your studies.